Hello and welcome to Gluten-Free and Gluttonous. I'm your host, Julie Young, and together we're going to explore the critical ins and outs of celiac disease and the gluten-free lifestyle. Each episode, I'll introduce you to a different expert where we'll talk about all the different aspects that celiac encompasses. We'll also try some different tasty treats so that we can show that gluten-free life is still gluttonous. Today's episode, we're talking to Dr. Layla Kia, a gastroenterologist and assistant professor of medicine in Chicago, Illinois. We're going to talk to Dr. Kia about the steps to diagnosis, what exactly celiac is and what its treatment entails, and how to manage life after diagnosis. Let's dig in and talk to Dr. Kia. Dr. Kia, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'd love to have you just introduce yourself um, and your background to start off. Thanks, Julie. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, My name is Leila Kia. I'm a gastroenterologist. Um, I see patients with a variety of of illnesses, um, including celiac disease, irritable bowel syndrome, um, gluten sensitivity and whatnot. So I'm happy to, to be here and, with, and answer any questions you may have. Awesome. So just, you know, diving in, you know, this is going to be our lead off episode for the series. So, you know, with your medical authority, you know, what is the official um, meaning of celiac disease? So celiac disease is basically um, a condition where you get inflammation in your small intestine. Um, which is the part of our gut that is primarily involved in digesting and absorbing nutrients uh, from the food that we eat. And basically what happens with celiac disease is that our bodies, for whatever reason, and patients who do have celiac disease do not recognize gluten as a normal, healthy part of our diet. And so the body perceives it as abnormal and then creates an inflammatory, an immune reaction that basically then causes damage to the surface of the small intestine. Um, And then as a result, we develop a host of symptoms that can be related to celiac disease. And that primarily the main issue that can happen is that when we destroy those cells in the small intestine, we're just not able to absorb nutrients in the way that we should. So who can have celiac disease? Is it, you know, more common in certain groups than others? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, anyone can get celiac disease. Um, there, It can present at any age, it can present in children, it can present later in life. Pretty much it doesn't matter what you look like or where you come from, you can still develop celiac disease. And you know, what exactly is the difference? Because I know there's a lot of confusion about like celiac versus some people have a gluten intolerance, but it's not celiac. And then, you know, speaking with some other people in the gluten-free community who have things like IBS or Crohn's where, again, it's not celiac, but they're still eating gluten-free. Um, what are some of those like major differences between the different GI diagnoses? kind of overarching or the simplest way of putting it is that celiac disease is the only one of those things that you mentioned that actually, aside from Crohn's disease, which is a little bit different, um, celiac disease is the only one that causes actual damage to the small intestine. Um, Non-gluten sensitivity, um, uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, I'm sorry, or or a gluten allergy um, or irritable bowel syndrome they present with symptoms that may be similar to celiac disease, but um, there's no actual damage to the small intestine. So what are some of these symptoms then that you can have for, you know, all, all across the spectrum of, of GI diagnoses, um, but in particular with celiac, like what are some of the more common symptoms? Yeah, good question. So traditionally the textbook, you know, kind of answer to that is the diarrhea and bloating and kind of gassy feelings. Um, are associated with celiac disease. And the reason why that is, is because the small intestine, again, is that area that becomes inflamed in celiac disease. And when you have inflammation in the tissue of the small intestine, if you can't absorb nutrients, if you can't absorb uh, proteins and fats, you're gonna have diarrhea as a result and it's gonna make you feel uncomfortable because you're losing a lot of that um, kind of nutrition that would previously be absorbed. 
Um, but the interesting thing about celiac disease, it can present with all kinds of symptoms. So some people present with fatigue, uh, brain fog, joint aches, rash, sometimes actually constipation, changes in bowel habits. Um, and some people have no symptoms actually. Some people come to the clinic because we find that on routine blood work, their blood counts are low, so they're anemic or for whatever reason, uh, blood tests were checked for the liver and we see slight elevations in their liver tests, or um, they may have unexplained bone loss or even infertility, and that actually prompts a workup for celiac disease. So symptoms can, can vary from none at all to really bad bloating, diarrhea, abdominal pain. What is sort of the proper way to go about getting diagnosed? Because I know there's a lot of people that have experienced you know, all across the board, you know, how they actually get to a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So what is the way you maybe should do it? The, the first step is really to talk to your primary care doctor. And the initial workup is actually very easy. It's a blood test. Um, you do have to be eating gluten for the test to be accurate. Um, and that's it. The test takes about a week to come back and it's looking for antibodies, which are certain types of proteins that develop in the body. Um, that um, are against uh, parts of the gluten products. And so if it's positive, um, it's pretty straightforward. That would prompt a referral to a gastroenterologist where we would sit down and talk about next steps, um, which actually typically include um, doing an endoscopy, um, which is a test where we put a flexible tube with a camera and a light inside the small intestine while the patient's asleep to look at that small intestine and see if there's any damage from uh, from celiac. And I just want to, you know, share for anybody that may be watching this, um, as someone who has had two endoscopies, I do want to point out, you know, it's non-invasive, so there's no, you know, like surgery, like open wounds, um, and it, it's just one day, you know, in and out, you're not staying overnight. Um, and personally, again, like, I was very anxious the first time, but you do, you know, you go to sleep um, and, you know, you wake up a few hours later, it's done. Um, I know some people have said they'll have like a sore throat or something. I personally felt fine um, and then, you know, just went home and, and took a nap and was good to go. So I think it's important to, to take away some of the fear of that as well. So, you know, once you, you get that diagnosis, um, sort of what are the important next steps then to build your care team and set yourself up for success and again because this is a lifelong um, diagnosis and the only treatment is adhering to gluten-free diet um, how do we make sure that we are coping with this and taking care of ourselves in a way that is you know, manageable and like I said, setting us up for a life of success. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I think it's very important to make sure that you set up um, and seek out a, a, a community and an environment and a medical community that is that understanding and supportive of that. So um, part of it is obviously having a physician that understands the diagnosis of celiac disease that has experience managing it. Um, but also who works with a group of other uh, providers that can help um, with uh, management of celiac disease. So the most important person in, a, in the life of a patient with celiac disease is really the registered dietitian, actually. Um, so I, I, that's the number one thing that I always um, refer patients to. We are lucky that at our, at our institution we have um, some wonderful dietitians that, that specialize in celiac disease that truly understand the implications beyond just printing out a list of foods to avoid, um, but really can talk to patients about um, the social aspects of celiac disease, dining out, avoiding cross-contamination, what to do when you're traveling, things like that. Because there are, you know, there are a lot of different types of dietitians out there and some may know a little bit about celiac disease or they may not understand that you have celiac versus um, non-celiac sensitivity, which is very different. Um, and um, also being plugged in with advocacy groups and 
having resources where you can connect maybe with other people who have celiac disease. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of people out on the internet that put in a lot of misinformation and, you know, it can get very confusing for patients. What can I eat? What, what can I do? And it's also nice to have a support group of other people that, that also are struggling with the same things. So um, I think those three things are very, very important. Advocacy, support, a dietitian, and a physician that truly understands the management of celiac. The last thing I want to cover is, you know, another important topic for me is, is the gluttonous part of this, of showing that we can still enjoy food and have great food that doesn't feel like a compromise. Um, so I know um, I already consumed my food um, and got footage of it previously, um, but we ordered from Beatrix. If you just want to share what you ordered, and I don't know if you have it with you to like, you know, hold it up real quick. excited about eating this. It looks delicious. Yes. Um, so, let's see, we can see. Yeah, um, ooh, that's beautiful. Got, but this is a beautiful avocado toast um, on gluten-free bread. And yes. um, yeah, it looks delicious. I can't wait to try it. And I think, you know, Beatrix is a great resource too for people who have maybe a mixed group where you have some people with restrictions and others who don't. Um, because they do take any allergens very seriously um, and they have a separate gluten-free menu. But to wrap this up, I just want to say thank you so much um, for all your time and stay tuned for next week when I talk to registered dietitian Taylor Silverdale.